Hi, it's me, Jazzy. I'm back with another tech-related video. And today, I'm looking at a vintage piece of test equipment. And this could be the vintagest piece of test equipment we've looked at so far. Oh, <laughs> it's in a pretty big box. Right, what have we got here? Always love opening boxes. Now, I think I know what I've got. I've got a lot of bubble wrap. That's a good thing. Oh, wow. Okay. And lots of these little dudes. Now, am I going to get this out of the box without getting little foam things all over the floor? Nope. There are definitely little foam things all over the floor. That'll be me doing a bit of sweeping up then. <laughs> this is very well wrapped. Wow, well, I can't find my way in. The entire video is going to be me undoing bubble wrap. Nearly, we can nearly see what we've got now. Is it one of those giant old fashioned toasters? No, it's an RF signal generator. Oh wow, this is super well packed. Wow, big shout out to whoever packed this. Quality job. Love to see stuff that's well packed and arrives in one piece. Someone's taken a lot of care on this. Now, this is very cool. I've been looking at these for a while. This is the Advanced Electronics E1 RF Signal Generator. And I just think it's so stylish. This is probably the retroist bit of retro tech I've taken a look at on the channel so far. It's pretty heavy, it's a bit of a chunk, but I love its retro style. And I believe this one's got valves inside. Does it work? We're not too sure, but we're gonna find out. We're gonna take a look inside first and have a look at what needs doing before we can safely power this up. But it's still a really cool bit of kit and definitely one that's worth looking at. Right, let's get this on the bench and see what we've got. The Advanced E1 Signal Generator still looks really cool. So to dismantle this is very simple. So you've got two screws at the top, two at the bottom, and then the whole lot will just pull out of the metal cabinet. So let's get these four screws out and see what lies inside. This is a pretty old bit of kit, so I've no idea what I'm going to find. Let's pull this off and see what we've got. Okay, it looks pretty clean inside. That's not too bad. I love those valves. Look at those. That is really cool. A little bit of rust in the bottom of there. Not too bad. I'll give that a sweep out. That's okay. Now let's have a look what we've got. So you've got your adjustable voltage there, 110, 210, 230, 250, two valves on there. Let's have a closer look. Now what is that? It's like a whole pile of components. I'm not even sure. That definitely doesn't look original. Not too sure on those. That's very unusual the way that's been put together. A little bulb on the top there to illuminate the dial. That's in better days, I think. What have we got underneath? That cable's definitely going to get replaced. That looks a bit weedy, that mains cable. And no obvious earth to the chassis. Hmm. Okay. Looks reasonable. Those capacitors will definitely need checking. I'm going to put the ESR meter on those in a minute before we even think about powering this up. Does look like someone's possibly done some work on this before, looking at the solder joints. Don't know if those are the original valves. Brimar BVA, made in England. Okay, pretty cool. Probably the first valve piece of equipment I've looked at on the channel. I just think they always look so cool. So let's pop that down because it does weigh an absolute ton. And then we can start on replacing the mains cable. Old one looks a bit weedy. I'm going to replace it with a molded plug and some three core cable that I've got here. So to start off, I'm just going to desolder the connections. 
these are literally just soldered in we replace this cable put an earth tag on the chassis as well there's a knot in the cable there it's a strain relief I'm not even going to bother trying to undo that because that cable is junk anyway so I can cut that off pull that through and then I can feed through the nice new mains cable I like to do everything I can to make sure these really old bits of test equipment are safe to power up and that they're going to actually have a useful life on my bench. That's the old rubber grommet removed. I'm going to put a proper strain relief in there. My new three core cable going through. Now I've just got to solder the live and neutral on. And these are just soldered on to the power input where I've just removed the old cable. Once those are soldered in, I'm just going to attach my earth tag to a handy nut there. I've put the little serrated washer in between as well. That's now earthed to the chassis. Apparently doing some research on these, it, it was pretty standard that they weren't actually earthed, which is a little bit worrying to me as that means the entire front panel could potentially be live when it's powered up. So much happier with that. We just need to put a strain relief on that now. One here that should fit. So let's have a look. These are quite nice, simple plastic ones. It just clips around the cable. That just grips the cable firmly and then push that in. That should just about go in with a bit of persuasion. Wow, that's tough. Yep, it's gonna go perfect. Okay, there we go. Look at that. That gives the strain relief rather than tying a knot in the cable inside. Much better solution. I think the black cable looks all right, actually. Kind of goes with the knobs on the front of the unit. Nice. Okay, I am happy with that. Now let's grab the ESR tester and have a look at those capacitors in the power supply. Okay, so I'm about to check these three capacitors in the power supply here just to check if they're okay or not. So I've got my meter all set up here. They're set to capacitance and ESR. So let's have a look. So there's three capacitors in the power supply I'm going to check. C9, C10 and C11. And that's these three here. So we've got this one, this one and this one. So let's check this one first. Hopefully this is 50 nanofarads. Right, what have we got? Here we go, give or take, 50 nanofarads. We've got an ESR of just over 500 ohms, which is okay for such a small capacitor. So this one looks pretty good. Take the probes off. Right, let's try these two electrolytics here. Both these are supposed to be four microfarads, hopefully. That and glasses. Right, there we go. Right, we have a problem here. A quarter of the capacitance I would expect, only one microfarad and an ESR of just under four and a half kilo ohms. That's pretty horrendous. I'm going to say that is no good. Right, let's do the next one, see if that's actually any better. It's not looking good. Slightly better at 1.2, but nowhere near the four microfarads I'm expecting, I'm afraid. And 3.1k ESR, still pretty rubbish. So, looks like I'm going to need to order myself some capacitors. Well, it looks like that's as far as I can go at the moment with my advanced E1 signal generator. I'm going to head off and order some new capacitors for it before we try and power it up for the first time. Because those ones in there are clearly past their best. Now there's an additional unexpected feature with this particular E1. I didn't realize that when I unpacked it for the first time, it's actually got a non-standard extra knob here. Hence that weird modification we saw inside the case. Now this is completely non-standard and has been added to this unit at some time, but possibly really early on in its history. I'm wondering if this is something to do with the modulation of the radio signals or something. It's also got an extra RF socket down here, which is completely non-standard. Now, the funny thing is, doing some research on this, I've spotted this exact E1 on an old radio forum from about 10 years ago, where the previous owner of this device was talking about the unusual modification inside. And I can see it's this exact model because it's got that extra switch 
and it's got the, the little rust patination around the top of the dial there, so you can see it's the same unit. So how bizarre that even 10 years ago, the previous owner was unsure what this mod was on the back. It's a little bit haphazardly put together and doesn't look like something that would have been put together at the factory. That's what got me a bit confused when I first opened the case up. So if anyone's got any thoughts on what they think this modification is that's been done to this all this time ago, and whether it's worth keeping or whether it's worth redoing in a slightly better way, let me know in the comments down below. I find this kind of stuff really fascinating. I've loved taking a look at this E1 signal generator. I'm gonna head off and order some capacitors now. So join me for part two where I'll be replacing the capacitors and seeing if we can get any life out of this old E1 signal generator, which it turns out could be as early as 1949. It's doing well for its years. So thanks for watching. As always, if you're enjoying my videos, it'd be really cool if you'd like to hit the like and subscribe button. Always much appreciated. A massive thanks to everyone that's subscribed so far. Join me soon for part two of this video, plus more electronics kits, test meters, and retro gaming. Take care, and I'll see you on the next one.